Prepare to be further amazed and educated. John Peters, take the microphone, sir. Oh, thank you. Now, I've been warned that I have to stand in front of this microphone and not travel. That's very difficult for me. So I'm sure if I start to drift, John will uh, give me a quick slap to knock me back in the line. So Dennis asked me to come and talk to you tonight about a topic that has already been talked about tonight, and that's the situation in Syria. And it's amazing how, uh, within a short span of time, this little country became the focal point of everything going on in the world and the ramifications uh, traveling out from Syria and how they're affecting the rest of the world, whether it's refugees, whether it's terrorism, whether it is uh, the threats of wider wars, uh, all these things coming out of this one country. So Dennis said, can you try to give some perspective, because probably a lot of people don't know a lot about the country itself. Uh, I'm going to touch a little bit on the conflict, and I think what I'm going to do is wait till the end, and I'll take any questions you may have about that aspect of it. But what I really would like to do is kind of give you a little travelogue and, and a little bit about Syria and how we got where we are. <clears throat> so, uh, first thing is, Syria is often referred to as a mosaic, and really culturally it is. Um, these are some of the facts. It's, it's 7,000 years old. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that I'm not going to cover 7,000 years of Syrian history. Yay! <laughs> I'm actually going to talk about the last hundred, and I'm going to condense that very shortly. Uh, its capital is the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. <clears throat> Official language is Arabic, uh, but there are other native languages to the country, including Armenian, Aramaic, Hebrew, Kurdish, among them. Uh, the religions practiced in the country include the three major religions, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Uh, and the, ethnic es excuse me, the ethnicities are even more diverse. So you have Arabic, Armenian, Kurdish, Jewish, Circassian, Assyrian, Druze, Turkmen, Yazidis, and actually others. So it's, it's very much a quilt of a society. Um, some of their past and current invaders and occupiers, they have a long and, and a history of resisting um, occupation, they include the Mongols, the Romans, the Crusaders, the Ottoman Turks, the French, the Israelis, and now us added to that list. So understanding Syria in terms of Syrian policy today and understanding why Syria takes the positions it takes regionally and internationally really starts to go back to the period of 1919 and the end of World War I. That's really the pivotal time for understanding modern Syria. But if you look at a map of Syria, this is in the period 1822 up to 1919, this is what Syria consisted of, what's generally referred to as something called natural Syria or greater Syria. It included all of what you currently know Syria to be, but as well, all of Lebanon, all of what's now Jordan, and all of Palestine or Israel. Those were all component parts of Syria, okay? World War I ended, and uh, our good friends, the French and the British, decided they had a better plan for Syria than what the people of Syria had, and they decided that they were going to divide up the Middle East into spoils and colonies for themselves. Their plan for Syria, you can see, was to eliminate Lebanon, eliminate Palestine, and eliminate what is now Jordan, which would become part of the British zone. Iraq in part, or not in part, but all of Iraq was to be part of the British zone. Uh, this was originally in the Sykes-Pico uh, plan to be an international zone, but in the end it became part of the British zone as well. So they carved off Lebanon, they carved off Palestine, and one of the effects of that when it comes to Syria is it reduced, effectively reduced the Syrian coastline by almost 75% if you look at it on the map. Because the Syrian coastline up to that point ran from here right up to about where it currently starts up in here. So this entire area was removed. With all the implications that has for commerce and shipping, strategic value and so forth, okay? 
Now, that was the plan of the British and the French, but not the plan of the Syrian people. And this is a resolution taken by the General Syrian Congress, which I actually issued on July the 2nd of 1919. And uh, in the preamble, uh, the real important takeaway here is that the Congress speaks for all the inhabitants of Syria at the time, regardless of their faith or ethnicity. Uh, and the resolution, the main part was they insisted on full and absolute political independence. They had been promised that by the Allied powers, by Britain and France, that if they joined the revolt against the Ottoman Turks, the revolt was successful, they would be granted their independence. Meanwhile, behind the backs of the Syrians, the British and the French were already carving up their country. And the Syrians were on to it, and they knew about it, and they made it clear that their position was they wanted full and absolute political independence. They did not want to become a colony of either Britain or France. In Article 7, they stated very clearly, we reject the claims of the, of the Zionists for the establishment of a Jewish commonwealth in that part of southern Syria, which is known as Palestine. Our Jewish fellow citizens shall continue to enjoy rights and to bear the responsibilities which are ours in common. So in Syria, even to today, although it's a popular narrative that there's all these sectarian differences and people are fighting each other, Syria is a country where uh, religion and ethnicity is really kind of irrelevant. Everybody that's there that considers themselves Syrians considers themselves Syrians. In fact, as one of my friends put it, um, to ask somebody what religious sect or what religion they belong to in Syria is considered highly inappropriate on a social level. It's sort of like ask, asking a man, did you have sex with your wife last night? That would be the comparable thing here. We we'd consider that pretty inappropriate. Um, it's considered a private matter. They're considered Syrians nationally, whether you're a Jew, whether you're a, a Christian, whether you're a Muslim, it doesn't matter, okay? Article 8, they made clear they wanted no dismemberment of Syria and no separation of Palestine or the coastal regions in the West or Lebanon from Syria, the main country. And they asked that the unity of the country be maintained under any other circumstance. That was the most important thing they wanted, all right? Then President Wilson, after World War I, in uh, follow-up to his principle of self-determination for peoples, and he wanted to do away with the colonial system and see people have self-determination, he sent the King Crane Commission to Syria and to the region to study what the aspirations of the people were. In his view, that's what should have prevailed, all right? These are some of the findings that that commission made in 1919 when they issued their report. Number one, they recommended that Syria remain united, not be divided, and that that was consistent with what most of the people, the vast majority of the people in Syria were asking for, okay? They listed the reasons why. Um, including uh, the commonality of the geographic, racial, and language factors, very common. So when you hear the term natural Syria, natural Syria doesn't refer to um, necessarily a, an ethnicity or religion being predominant. What it really refers to is a country that operated both commercially, politically, uh, culturally, as one unit, okay? For example, linguistically, uh, the dialect of Arabic that was spoken was the same in Lebanon, the same in Palestine, the same in Syria proper. If you go to Egypt, it's a much different dialect of Arabic. It's still Arabic. You go to Iraq, it's even a different dialect. So that's one of the things that defined what Syria was, all right? Their recommendation regarding Lebanon was that it remain part of the main Syrian state and that it not be divided off, which is what the French intended to do. The French intended to divide it off because it was weaker, smaller, and it would be dependent upon the French. And that's what the French wanted. They wanted a foothold in the region. Uh, so they say, for the sake of the larger interests of both Lebanon and Syria, then the unity of Syria is to be pursued. So it's the common theme in their report. And lastly, on a very hotbed issue that we deal with today, uh, the issue of Palestine. Now, by the time that this report was written, it was known 
that the Zionist movement in Europe wanted to transform Palestine into a Jewish state. That was the plan. It wasn't secretive. That's what they were lobbying for. King Crane found that that was absolutely the worst thing that could happen. And they're saying, we recommend serious modification of the extreme Zionist program for Palestine, of unlimited immigration of Jews, looking finally to making Palestine a distinctly Jewish state. In their view, a national home for the Jewish people is not the equivalent to making Palestine into a Jewish state, nor can the erection of such a Jewish state be accomplished without the gravest trespass upon the civil and religious rights of the existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. When this was written, the non-Jewish communities in Palestine were 97% of the population. That's kind of hard to believe when we look at what we're presented with today as Israel. Okay, so there was definitely a transformation. Uh, in their concluding paragraph, they're saying it's to be remembered that the non-Jewish population of Palestine, nearly nine-tenths of the whole, are emphatically against the entire Zionist program. And the tables show that there was no one thing upon which the population of Palestine was more agreed to than this. So the, again, once again, if it's to the self-determination of the people and the indigenous people of that country is to be followed, King Crane is saying, keep Syria unified, do not divide Palestine and Lebanon from Syria, do not not allow Palestine to be transformed into a Jewish state at the expense of the non-Jewish population in Palestine. That's not what they want, and, and the only way that's going to happen is if you force it on them, and that's not where we're supposed to be doing, okay? This is further recommendations. They're saying uh, it's not only not supported in Palestine, but in Syria generally, there is strong opposition to this program for Palestine being transformed into a Jewish state. Only two requests, one for united Syria and one for independence, had larger support than the one opposing the transformation of Palestine. And, they, and I'm not going to read it all, but they go on to point out, look, the people that they talked to said the only way that program could be carried out is by force of arms. And at, at that time in 1919, they're saying the officers generally thought that a force of not less than 50,000 soldiers would be required even to initiate the program because the opposition to it is so strong. Okay. And they, they end by saying the initial claim that's often submitted by the Zionist representatives that they have a right to Palestine based on an occupation of 2,000 years ago can hardly be seriously considered. And yet, today we have Israel in place of Palestine, okay, and all the problems attendant with it. Unfortunately, King Crane, I call it the prophecy ignored because everything they predicted came to pass, okay? Everything they recommended against was disregarded. And the reason it was disregarded is because the outcome for Syria and that region was determined by the British and the French. America was still a minor player at that time on the world stage, even though we basically helped them win World War I. Diplomatically, in terms of our weight in the world, we weren't there yet. And the British and the French prevailed over Wilson. So the end result was that Syria was divided. Palestine, Jordan, and Lebanon separated from Syria. Palestine was forcibly uh, converted to the Zionist program. You had four million Palestin uh, Palestinian refugees created. An enormous military effort to sustain this Jewish state, not only from within the Jewish state itself, but from outside of it in the form of American military commitments and other military commitments. The amount of military aid that we send to Israel on an annual basis in the billions of dollars. The fact that they're the only nuclear power in the region now, and they introduced uh, nuclear weapons now into the region. Okay, so everything that they were warning against is now coming to pass, and now we're having to pay the bill for it. Lebanon was forced to request the Syrian military to intervene in their civil war in 1976. In fact, the Syrian army stayed in Lebanon for 30 years to stabilize that country because it's so tiny and it doesn't have a viable national army that when civil war broke out, they had nobody to turn to. And the only ones they really trusted were the Syrians because it's, I tell people separating Lebanon from Syria and pretending they're two different countries would be like drawing a line down the middle of Michigan 
in <laughs> and saying the people live in Grand Rapids are not the same as the people that live on the east part of the line. I mean, you know, it's separate, literally separated families. And I mean, it, it's ridiculous. So. Lebanon's borders and airspace now routinely invaded by Israel. Once again, because the country's too small, it's too weak, it can't even defend itself, all right? So, um, now Jordan is being used as a base of operations by the American military to train insurgents to try to overthrow the government in Syria. So this this land that was taken off of Syria is now being used as a base to attack Syria proper. It's, it's quite interesting. Whoops, let me go back. I had one more thing on there. Oh, yeah. So in today, just as you saw the Syrian army uh, go to Lebanon to help them with their civil war, and the Syrians have always, it's, it's a... It's a non-negotiable point for Syrians, their support for Palestinian self-determination. And they will always support the Palestinians, and they always have. Now, when Syria's in trouble, the Palestinians have come to fight in Syria, on, Syria, on the government side, as have the Lebanese resistance. So you see this, regardless of where the lines were drawn, you see this melding and inter interchange of people who were really once just all Syrian. So let's talk about Syria before March 2011, which is the time frame attributed generally to when the, the war in Syria began, the current war. And it's been going on so long now, it's hard to remember what Syria was before. But these are some basic facts. It was rated the fourth safest country in the world to visit prior to the start of this war. It has a secular government. Uh, it's composed of all genders, religions, and ethnicities. Uh, there's a... a a president, a prime minister, and a parliament. It's a parliamentary system. And women uh, participate in every level of life in Syria, from, uh, unfortunately now, frontline military duty. We've had a lot of women killed in Syria in the armed forces in these last seven years. Uh, right up to the government, to education, and every other aspect of the society. Uh, in fact, currently, there's a, a female vice president, the speaker of the parliament's a woman, and the chief presidential advisor and press secretary is a woman. Uh, they have paid education, paid health care. No, there's no income tax in Syria. You may want to think about Syria for retirement. Uh, the country was at peace. It had no wars it was involved in. Uh, it did not have a, a Rothschild central bank. It still doesn't. And it had no foreign debt. Some people speculate that that's why one of the reasons it was targeted. Um, and GMOs are banned. So Syria is a safe harbor. A lot of people talk about the Syrian refugee problem where people are leaving Syria for Europe and other parts and having to accommodate it. But Syria has always been a safe harbor in the region for refugees from neighboring countries. Um, right at the time of World War I, during the Turkish genocide of the Armenians, the Syrians took in about 60,000 Armenians and gave them safe haven. And they continue to be. Armenians are a very integral part of Syrian culture and society. Um, they are home to over 500,000 Palestinian refugees dislodged either in 1948 or in 1967. Um, there were over a million Iraqi refugees that were taken in in Syria after the U.S. invasion of Iraq. And in 2006, when Israel invaded Lebanon, Syrians took in 400,000 Lebanese across the border. Not only did they take them in, but people will tell you who, who were there, it's really quite incredible. The government came to all of these Lebanese people. They gave them money. They gave them a cell phone. They arranged for places that they could live in the country. Syrian people who had extra houses would put them up. There's one incredible story about a woman who went to the border and met this Lebanese woman coming across with a young child. And she said, I don't have any money to give you. I don't have a house to give you, but I will help nurse your child if you need me to nurse your child. There's very, very close ties between the Lebanese and Syrian people. They're really, they're the same people, despite where France drew the line. 
Okay, let's talk about Assad the Animal. Is When President Trump called him Assad the Animal, I thought, you know, he should go into pro wrestling because that'd be a great name for pro wrestling. <laughs> yeah, so here he is with his wife. You can see how frightened all his people are of him. This is in a church. Uh, this was 2016. He was visiting a church in Damascus for the Christmas celebration. And he and his wife, it's, it's kind of funny. Some people, you know, it's almost odd. The way they move about, because the way our um, leaders move about, there's always a phalanx of security and, you know, black cars and all this stuff. But it's not unusual to see him driving to work and back in Damascus by himself or driving somewhere else or walking wherever. And the same with his wife. They, they just don't kind of have that pretentiousness about him that we're used to with leaders and rulers. So... So let's talk about the man instead of the animal. So the background on uh, Bashar al-Assad is he was educated and worked as an ophthalmologist. He's a medical doctor. Uh, unlike our last four presidents, he actually served in his nation's armed forces. Uh, he speaks Arabic, English, and French fluently. Married to Asma al-Assad in 2000. They have three children. His popularity among the Syrians, this is not his press office. This is our CIA and NATO did a study while the war was on to try to gauge what kind of popular support he had to know what kind of effort might be required to overthrow him. And unfortunately, they both came to identical conclusions, which were that he enjoyed at least 70% support among the Syrian people. The rebels, he said, the studies came to the conclusion enjoyed about 10%, and there maybe was a 20% swing factor in the middle, either people who didn't care or people who could go one way or the other, whatever. I can tell you this, since the war, his popularity has skyrocketed in the country, okay? It's probably 90% now. Um, he pioneered and is credited with pioneering the modernization and political reforms in the country. His father was largely responsible for the first big push in that respect. But even people who don't like him politically, and, you know, he has opponents. He's like any other leader. There is opposition in Syria. They don't like certain policies that he has, or they don't think he's moving the pace of reforms fast enough, or they feel there's too much corruption in the government somewhere. So it's not that there's no opposition, but that's political political opposition, and we'll distinguish that from armed opposition, which is we're going to talk about. But even those who oppose him, and I can tell you, I, I was telling John this story, Mike Taylor in Rochester is from Syria, and we have long, lengthy discussions as Syrians are known to do on politics. And, you know, he said, I really don't like him. I, I would vote for somebody else for president, but I have to give him credit. You can't deny what he's done for the country. He's opened the borders for free trade. He's brought in the Internet. Uh, you know, both he and his wife are very educated people, and the younger people in Syria really looked up to them as people who could move the country forward and would move the country forward. But as I was also explaining to John, this concept that Americans think if democracy was even our go our goal in Syria, which it's not, but assuming it was, this that you, there's this template where you can come in and turn a country 180 degrees in a month, and now they're going to be an American-style democracy. It doesn't happen like that. Syria is a very complex mosaic and a very traditional culture. I mean, it's 7,000 years old, okay? You have components of the society that are so conservative that just as the younger people think the pace of modernization is not fast enough, the traditional parts of the society see it as a threat and they want, they don't want it. So you have to walk very carefully and you have to feed it in at a certain rate. The analogy I would use is like if you were going to water a plant, you don't take a bucket of water and pour the whole bucket on the plant because it can't absorb the water. That's true in societies. When they're going through transition in a system like this, it takes time for it to be absorbed. You get let them digest a little bit, then you move forward on the next one. Okay, he's been the president since 2000, uh, and he was overwhelmingly reelected in 2014. Despite the best efforts of the countries aligned against him, 
to pe keep uh, Syrian people from voting who were no longer in Syria. The Americans blocked voting locations. There were people that couldn't vote at embassies. The European countries did the same thing. And these people literally got on planes and trains and went to places where they could vote. In Lebanon, the line to vote was so long, they couldn't close the polling and it, it, I think it was almost three miles long, the line of people lined up to vote, Syrians who were in Lebanon, okay? All right, so here's the first lady of Syria. So she's the animal's wife, I guess we'll call her. And this is a little bit of background on his wife. She's got a degree in computer science from Queen's College of London. She was basically raised in London. Her father is a Syrian doctor. Um, she worked as an investment banker in the UK for many years before moving back to Syria. Marrying Bashar Assad in 2000. Uh, they have three children. She speaks four languages. And she's very actively involved in the civic affairs in Syria. She's uh, particularly involved with women's issues, and in particular, they're the mothers of soldiers uh, and those who have been killed in the war, as well as orphans whose parents have been killed in the war. Okay? Very, very popular in the country. Oh, and I wanted to, I picked this picture for a reason, because this really demonstrates something interesting. In one picture, you see the traditional and you see the modern, okay? And that's what's interesting in Syria. There are women in Syria that wear the veil, and they're friends with women who don't wear the veil. It's totally voluntary. If you want to wear it, you don't get criticized for wearing it. The government doesn't tell you, oh, you can't wear that. That's backwards. You want to go without the veil, there's no uh, moral police chasing you around telling you you got to put a veil on. So women are very fully emancipated in Syria, and they have the freedom to live the way they want to live. All right, let's talk about the war now. This is not a civil war. This was a full spectrum war against Syria as a nation based upon its resistance to the Western ambitions to control and redirect Syrian policy. Okay, several things triggered this, but in reality, the West has always been trying to control Syria ever since it declared independence in 46. Uh, from 46 until, say, the 70s, 80s, it was largely based on the Cold War competitions. Syria has always had a long-standing relationship with Russia. There's a reason for that. Syria is only 500 miles from Russia. It's not 7,000 miles away like it is from us. It's right in their backyard. And they also share certain things in common, uh, the, the Orthodox Christian faith uh, and, and other things called so there's always been a strong relationship between Russia and Syria. But during the Cold War, that was not good news for Syria because the U.S. had them on their target list. CIA was active in trying to cause governments to be overthrown then, just as they are now. Um, and then in more recent times, uh, the U.S. thought that they had maneuvered this new young leader in Syria to come to the side of the United States and the West in general and to do their bidding. And much to their dismay, they found out that he's an, as independent a thinker as his father was and that there are certain uh, national principles that go with Syria that aren't going to change. It doesn't matter who you're going to put in that office because if they don't follow them, the Syrian people will not accept them as a leader. So... For example, they asked him to agree to put this um, anti-missile shield system, it, it allows Syria to be used as one of the locations for this missile shield system. Syrians said, no, we're not going to do that. They wanted to allow a pipeline to run from the Gulf states through Syria up into Europe. He said, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, they wanted him, in large part, to separate from the relationship with Iran and isolate Iran, and he said, we're not going to do that. So that was three strikes. And the plan to overthrow him really didn't start in 2010. It started much, much earlier. You can go online. There's an actual interview 
who did it? I think Christiane Amanpour did it with him, and it was in 2005. And she's already saying, you know, that they're planning to overthrow you. They got rid of Saddam. Now they're planning to overthrow you. How do you feel about that? So, I mean, it was already known as early as 2005 that that was the plan. But things really kicked off in March of 2011. Uh, it started even before the war with U.S. imposed economic sanctions. They were placed on Syria in 2007 and they have never been lifted. And some people in Syria will tell you, when I talk to people in Syria, they'll tell you, John, worse than the war are the sanctions. The sanctions have made life impossible here. It's a living hell. You can't get basic necessities. Everything's banned because it's, quote, dual purpose, meaning it could be used somehow for a military weapon because you could pick it up and throw it at somebody, I guess. I don't know. So uh, they've been very, very harmful to the economy and to the to the people in Syria. Then on top of it, the war. The next step was the usual template we use when we want to overthrow a leader. There's a media and a propaganda campaign to demonize the leader of the country as a tyrannical dictator and the opposition as moderate democracy seekers, right? That's always what we're telling people. Uh, then there were attempts to divide the government among itself and the military from the government. The way that was accomplished, uh, attempted was twofold. One was threats that if you don't leave the government, if you don't break with this government, you're going to face war crimes before the International Criminal Court. And the other was using Gulf states' money, the ones who were funding this, making individual financial inducements to people, politicians and military men, to leave the government. Okay? Now, some people did. And when uh, President Assad was interviewed about that early on, yes, sir. Could you move the microphone up a little bit? Yeah. Because yeah, I think it is up, right? The microphone is up. Yeah. Yeah, I can hear it. I can turn it around. Oh, all right. That better? Okay. So these financial inducements and these threats worked to some extent. And early on in the conflict, there was an interview with President Assad, and they said, aren't these, uh, isn't this the end of your country, the fact that these people are leaving? And then they were very few. I mean, you're talking less than 5%. And he said, no, actually, they're the best thing that can happen for the country because the people who care about the country will stay and they will fight. And those that will leave for a paycheck, we don't need them anyway and we don't want them here. They obviously are more of a liability than they would be an asset. So this is a good answer. Um, they, they originally tried to make this a domestic war, so they could call it a civil war, but there was never enough domestic opposition and certainly not enough willing to take up arms to make the difference they needed made. So the next step in this process was to infiltrate mercenaries, paid mercenaries into Syria to fight the war that they would then call a civil war. I think I put it on this slide. Well, I can tell you this. The Syrian armed forces have captured fighters from over 90 different countries, including virtually every country in Europe and the United States, China, uh, Chechnya, uh, everywhere where they could recruit these Islamic uh, jihadists from. They're offering them a lot of money in, in the eyes of these fighters to fight in Syria. The Saudi Arabians are bankrolling it. The Qataris are bankrolling it. And so what we started doing was we weren't doing the direct recruiting, but we were providing the logistical support, weaponry, um, uh, intelligence information, and the whole Benghazi thing. They never wanted to scratch this deep because both parties have their hands dirty with it. But the truth of Benghazi was that was the kickoff to the mercenary war against Syria. After Gaddafi was overthrown, they set up a way station in Benghazi. Remember they said that there's a CIA station there. Why is there a CIA station in Benghazi? They were shipping weapons out of Gaddafi's arsenals into Turkey, arming these mercenaries in Turkey and infiltrating them down through the Turkish border into northern Syria. Okay, Hillary Clinton, that's what she, that was her program. 
I met somebody from Washington, D.C. one time, and we were talking about it. And I said, why do you think she left those guys to die? And, and this woman told me, she said, John, dead men don't tell tales. And I knew exactly what she meant, okay? And you've never heard it come out. You've never heard in all the discussion. What's all the discussion about Benghazi? Why didn't you get them security? It wasn't a movie they were mad about. You hear all these other things, but they never dig down to go to what the central point is, like what were they doing in Benghazi? So, uh, yeah, weapons, funding, logistics, and training were provided by our country, England, France, Turkey, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. That's quite an alignment to have against you, okay? So these are some of the things that our moderate democracy seekers have been doing in our name in Syria, okay? They've looted all the factories in Syria, especially up in Aleppo and in northern Syria, and they're trucking machinery out of these factories up into Turkey and selling it, okay? Uh, Syrian antiquities, which if you've ever been to Syria, if you've heard anything about Syria, you can imagine with a country with 7,000 years of tradition, there's world historical antiquities, not just Syrian historical, world historical. They've been looted, shipped off to black markets for sale through Turkey. The city of Palmyra, or Tudmore as it's called in Syria, that's, uh, you may remember the pictures of Palmyra with the Roman columns and beautiful, beautiful site. Uh, it was demolished twice while we were in Syria, supposedly fighting ISIS. ISIS was blowing up Palmyra and we didn't lift a finger, okay? Uh, they came up with an ingenious idea as they were being defeated of dumping diesel fuel into the water aquifers to try to poison the water supply. Uh, they stole the oil and shipped it up by convoys into Turkey and were selling it up in Turkey. And interestingly, all this is happening. Somehow we don't know about it. With all of our satellite technology that we can see, we can read a newspaper from outer space in somebody's hands, but we can't see a convoy of 100 fuel trucks going from the Syrian desert all the way up into Turkey in ISIS territory. The ones who exposed us were the Russians. When the Russians came in in uh, November of 2015. They weren't on the ground more than, I don't think, six hours. They were already out on the first mission, and their first missions were to attack this oil business and the convoys. Now, how did they know, and how were they able to do it? And yet, us and our 60-man, our 60-nation coalition was not able to intervene to stop that from happening. Okay? Interesting. Uh, the destruction of churches and and the burning of uh, their contents it's just it's obscene i mean it has the point of all of this the destruction of infrastructure if you want to be the next government in the country are you going to destroy the the people's ability to live destroy the infrastructure destroy their history is that your platform that you're going to run on when you run the people of syria want nothing to do with these people and rightfully so because first of all they're not syrians okay like i said there, there's a village in Syria. A guy back in Syria told me this story. He said, John, they drove all the people out. And he goes, you know who's living there now? I said, who? He goes, there's 3,000 Chinese Uyghurs, or Uyghurs, the Muslims from China. And they sent for their families. And their families are living there, too. And the people who live there are out of the country. They're driven out. Now, the Chinese have also sent troops, but the Chinese are very discreet. They don't want it really known that they have armed forces in Syria, but they sent a very large contingent, and they sent them specifically to deal with the Uyghurs. As the Russians came to Syria, not really because it's Syria, the Russians came for this reason. One of the largest components in this uh, mercenary force comes from Chechnya. And the Russians know that they're gonna be fighting them sooner or later. So their attitude is, we, we need to go to Syria and end this there, or we're going to be fighting them on our shore next, just like we have before. So a lot of the countries that have come into Syria to fight on the side of the government, it's, it has really has nothing to do with the government or their affinity for the government. It's for a more self-serving purpose, okay? And now we have U.S. direct intervention. So they went from sanctions to threats and inducements uh, to uh, mercenaries to now direct military intervention. We've established multiple 
permanent military bases on Syrian soil. Our military, our Air Force, has launched attacks against Syrian government forces in Syria, claiming they were a threat to our forces. Now, there's an interesting concept. We're in the country illegally. They're trying to liberate their parts of their country, and they are therefore a threat to us that needs to be wiped out. It's the ultimate in pretzel logic. Uh, I think to date we've killed over 100 Syrian soldiers uh, in these attacks. We shot down at least one Syrian military aircraft, all within the boundaries of Syria, mind you, okay? So we're operating in Syria despite the fact that there's been no congressional declaration of war, no identified threat by the Syrians to us to do us any harm, no UN mandate, and certainly no authority from the government of Syria. And yet we're there. I think as libertarians, that's maybe the most important point to focus on. How are we there? And how does this continue to go unabated. I just think the theory is we'll test the limits. And if we get away with this, then we're going to move it to the next level. Nobody's stopping us. Okay? They've taken control of a lot of the Syrian oil and gas resources in the eastern part of the country. Uh, when the Syrians have tried to enter these areas, as I mentioned, they've been attacked as a threat. Uh, we're aiding and promoting an insurrection in these separatist movements. There's an area called Altanaf uh, down in the south part of Syria near the Iraqi border. They don't want... They've been put the Syrians on notice. Don't come anywhere near here. They're training an army of, I don't know, they say 30,000. Who knows what it is. Um, they've also killed many, many Syrian civilians in these air attacks. And Raqqa was completely destroyed by the Americans. This was a city, 300,000 people, okay? And there is nothing left of Raqqa. I mean, it's just rubble. There is nothing left of it. Now, the Americans' argument is, yeah, well, that's because that's where ISIS was based, and we had to go in and fight ISIS. Let me tell you something. Before they moved into Raqqa to declare it liberated, they moved ISIS out of Raqqa, and they repositioned them in Deir Azor to fight against the Syrian army down there. There's even videos of them leaving on buses and the Americans uh, expediting their, their departure. They accomplished two things. Number one, they walk into a city that's not defended and say, look, we liberated the city. Great. And they redeploy those forces to fight against the army that they want them to fight against. So we move ISIS around like chess pieces in Syria. Okay. So let's look at this little timeline. So 1916 to 1918, Syria spent fighting to end the Ottoman Turkish occupation, all right? In 1919, France and England divide the country against the will of its people and then subject them to colonial rule. In 1946, Syria declares independence from French colonial rule after fighting them for years. In 2011, the U.S., England, and France start this covert war against Syria, operating through Turkey. You notice I've highlighted and read these countries. You notice that they keep repeating. It's the same countries that they had to deal with in 1915. They can't get rid of them, okay? Turkey invaded northern Syria this year. France, England, and the U.S., April 13th, what do they do? They show up for the world's largest fireworks show and launch 103 cruise missiles into Syria. OK, and it just goes on and on. So unfortunately, Syrians fight for their independence just doesn't end. And it's just something that's part of their DNA and they're used to. And if you talk to them, uh, they will tell you they don't like it. They would like to go back to a peaceful situation. But if they have to fight, they're going to fight and they're not going to buckle under to what we want them to do. They're not going to elect some. Uh, puppet leader who was uh, called in a Western country to come in and run Syria or one that's in Syria that was their, their talking points guy. The Syrian people would never tolerate that. So you hear a lot of times they say, why doesn't Assad just step down? For the sake of his country, why doesn't he just step down? Then there can be peace. That's really misleading because the reason he's popular is because he's a nationalist and because he stood up 
to these plans to try to force the country under the thumb of the West. And the people there find him even more popular because of that. If he was replaced tomorrow with somebody who was a yes man for uh, NATO and the United States, he would be gone in a month. Okay, he won't last in Syria. So it doesn't matter whether it's Bashar al-Assad or who it is, but they've got to have the Syrian DNA and they've got to have the uh, the values and um, and policies that Syrians are going to accept. So we can kill him tomorrow, put in whoever we want. It doesn't mean things are going to change. That's just what they're selling the rest of the world, that if he would just step down, then there would be peace and everything would be fine. So anyway, I think this is the end of it. But if you have any questions, oh, you know what? I did have a couple other points I want to make first. Oh, yeah. Another thing you hear all the time is that Bashar al-Assad is an Alawite. He comes from an Alawite region, and you have this minority Alawite sect running the government and controlling the government and the army and suppressing a Sunni majority population. I had this conversation with a good friend of mine, Syrian friend of mine. He was laughing his head off. He goes, do, do, they, do they know what the government's composed of? Because if you go down every cabinet position in the government, if you go through the top positions in military intelligence and the command position, they're all Sunnis, okay? There are Alawites in some positions, but by and large... The positions held by the Sunnis are representative of their roughly 80% majority in the country. There's no way that he could survive a week if his program was to suppress the Sunni population. Okay, He wouldn't last a week. Probably wouldn't, probably wouldn't last a day. Uh, so that's a very large misnomer. And not only that, certainly 80% of the armed forces are Sunni. The big fail for the United States and NATO was this. They really expected the army to break with him and disintegrate, and it didn't. And that was their worst nightmare. So you have the majority of the people supporting the government, the military supporting the government, and the majority of the people supporting their military. They're very together on this. So there's not a lot of wiggle room for America's program on, over there. And I don't know how long we'll continue to escalate it militarily to try to achieve what we're going to. But I just, I, I would agree with Scott Horton. I think we've walked into another hornet's nest that we're going to end up achieving nothing. We're going to be the ones to suffer for it, along with the people people of the region and in the end nothing's really going to change yes well, you mentioned Scott Horton he talked about uh, the gas the gas and so can you uh, speak how can we uh, support somebody that gas his own people which yeah well that's another one didn't that's the same thing we said about Stam same thing we said about Gaddafi I mean it's just it's funny because it's like a template right you just put it over the next guy you want to get rid of <laughs> the Syrians had uh, chem they had chemical and biological weapons and the reason they developed them is because Israel developed a nuclear weapon so they sometimes call it the poor man's nuclear weapon they needed a deterrent effect for Israel's nuclear power and they gained it through chemical and biological weapons okay in 2013 when we were preparing under Obama to invade Syria because he gassed his own people the Russians John Kerry said the only way he can avoid it is if he re just relinquishes all his chemical weapons and he said okay fine we'll get rid of them that's not what he wanted to hear of course uh, and the Russians brokered that deal and under international supervision the chemical weapons were removed and verified not only by the OPCW but by the US because the US was the one disposing of them actually so as of 2015 uh, or I'm sorry, 13, they were verified not to, to no longer have a chemical weapons capacity. Okay, that's one thing. The second thing is, notice that every one of these allegations carries a similar pattern, all right? The rebels are being routed in a particular area. They need help. And what they really want is direct Western military intervention. And they know what the trigger is for that. And it's a chemical weapons incident, right? So they have access to chemical weapons, and it's been verified that they have chemical weapons. Uh, 
Sometimes they stage an actual chemical weapons attack. Sometimes they're creating a video where literally there is no chemical weapons attack. But you see them like hosing people off and people are crying and and, and literally it's staged. Okay. The time of the 2013 chemical attack. The Syrian government had called the UN inspectors to Damascus to investigate a prior episode where Syrian forces were attacked with chemical weapons. And they're gonna send them up to this area outside of Damascus. The day they arrived in Damascus was the day that chemical weapons attack occurred in Damascus. Now, you got to believe that the Syrian government is incredibly stupid or suicidal, one of the two, because they know the same thing the rebels know. The trigger for Western military intervention is going to be chemical weapons use. So, I mean, at some point you have to use logic and say, who stands to gain by this? If there really was a chemical weapons attack, why would the government do it? The other thing is... There's certain units in the military, even when they had them, that are assigned to use chemical weapons, like in our military. If Kerry was here, I would ask him, but most militaries have a dedicated unit that's a chemical weapons unit. It's not like every infantry unit carries chemical weapons around and they just lob them into locations because you have to be very careful, especially when you're in close quarters where you take yourself out, okay? And also, in every one of these incidents, the government forces were on the verge of a victory. There's no reason for them to use the chemical weapons. They can actually kill way more people with their conventional arsenal. They have a very strong conventional arsenal, and they could kill way more people that way if their goal was to go out and kill civilians, okay? So on, there's no level on which it's logical, number one. Number two is, where is the evidence, okay? They keep asking us to come in and investigate. Let's take the one that took place in Khan Shakun, which was last April, a year ago. <clears throat> if you remember, Donald Trump's daughter was very upset at the picture she saw about the chemical attack and these poor children. And daddy said, I'm going to take care of it. And he's, he fires 59 cruise missiles into Syria. Nobody's been to the site. No investigation has taken place. No samples have been gathered. We know the government did We know, A, it is a chemical weapon, and B, we know the government did it. Wow. It must be Karnak. So anyway, uh, what happens, if you remember this, what happens within weeks af after the attack? Remember, General Mattis came out and said, we don't have any evidence that the government used chemical weapons. Well, gee, isn't that something maybe we should have known before you launched a cruise missile attack on another country? So what happens this year, right? It's the same pattern. There's this attack in Duma, okay, supposedly. We go ahead, we launch an attack. The OPCW investigators were there, and their investigation was supposed to start within hours after the cruise missile attack actually occurred. I mean, they weren't timing it to the cruise missile attack. My point is they had already had it scheduled. Our attack was maybe six hours before they were scheduled to go in and investigate. One of the buildings we destroyed in Damascus had been inspected in November of last year by the OPCW, and they verified no trace of chemical weapons, no evidence of chemical weapons production, no precursors, nothing. They found nothing. That's one of the buildings we destroyed. Okay, well, once it's destroyed, are you going to find the evidence? No, you're not going to find the evidence. So if you, if you look at the timing of these things, it kind of tells you what's really behind it. We're looking for an excuse to intervene directly militarily because our mercenaries are being routed. And let me tell you, this has been incredibly costly for the Syrian government as well. You hear numbers like half a million people killed in Syria. You hear these numbers tossed around. But they don't tell you what that half a million is comprised of. Probably the largest part would be Syrian civilians killed by these mercenaries. Second largest part would be mercenaries killed by the Syrian government, Syrian armed forces. And then the third category would be Syrian uh, soldiers killed by the terrorists, okay? I, I, I've heard different numbers, and I certainly don't have the exact number, but I can tell you that the Syrian army has lost tens of thousands of men fighting these guys. Tens of thousands, okay? And that doesn't count wounded. I'm talking about guys killed. So it's been a major, major impact on the military. They lost a lot, especially in the early part of the conflict. 
because it's a conventional army trained to fight a conventional war, not a counterinsurgency in city limits. So they had to adapt tactics. And before they got to that point, they took some very, very serious losses. So. Um, what they can't square in their head is, I thought you said you were here to fight terrorism. We're fight. We're the ones who are fighting terrorists. Why are you shooting at us? Okay. So it's it's just it's crazy, right? Yes, yes sir. Uh, well, who, who's driving the U.S. policy here? Who's driving this? It's really hard to say. You know, some people the theory is it's this deep state that we call it, right? These are not like personalities that you see in the media and all that all the time, but maybe they're operating behind the scenes, but they, they have the levers of power. I don't, I really don't know. I do know, I mean, we know the CIA is involved because it's been conceded that they've been involved. Uh, Trump to me is sort of an enigma. He came in saying, no, I'm not gonna do this anymore. And then, well, here's another example. He just said two days before the last chemical attack, we're done in Syria, we're getting out. Then there's a chemical attack. No, we're back in. In fact, we don't know when we're going to leave now, right? So I, I don't know. It's like there isn't a policy almost, but the people, in my opinion, that are driving it, I always say follow the dollars, okay? And that usually tells you. So... People have vested interest in oil and gas production and this pipeline that they want to put across, weapons manufacture. I don't know. Somebody's making a lot of money the longer the war goes on. Yes, sir. Well, Wesley Clark's uh, revelation of about eight years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about the five government or seven governments in five years. Yeah. Well, here it is, right? Iraq, Syria. Yeah, Syria's always been a tough nut. Yeah. Well, and the other problem is they don't have any popular support for the program in the country. Like, even let's take the Kurds, okay? The Kurds in Syria. It's, first of all, it's not fair. When we talk about the Kurds, we tend to talk about them as a monolith, like they are all have the same politics, same ambitions. They don't. There's Kurds in Syria that want to remain part of Syria, and they just want local autonomy. There are Kurds that want to declare an independent Kurdish state. There are Kurds in Syria that don't get along with the Kurds in Iraq. There are divisions within each Kurdish group. I mean, it's, you know, it is, there's no real Kurdish thing. They're like libertarians. Yeah. <laughs> So, the, well, we'll take the example that Scott was talking about, Afrin, the town of Afrin. The Syrian army, when the Turks were preparing to come in, the Syrian army said, just surrender the town. Let us come into the town and, and position our forces there. And the Kurds said, no, nope, you're not coming in. They're flying the Kurdish flag. And they got hammered by the Turks. And when it was almost all over, they told the Syrian army, okay, come on in. Well, it's a little too late. I mean, so... They're in a tough position. They've got to contend with the Turks. They've got to contend with um, some of the local forces. They wanted to declare a Kurdish state in northern Syria. And the only problem is there's a lot of other minorities in that same region that did not support it. So they tried to cleanse the area of those other minorities so that they could have their own area. But w I always knew that the Turks were not going to stand by and watch it happen, even if the Americans were supporting them. And that's exactly what's happened. The Turks won't tolerate it. Yes, sir. That's a point I'd like to make. And uh, about a month before the uh, latest you know, chemical attack allegedly happened in Syria on Russia today, uh, they reported that the rebels were plotting the false flag that it was going to be attributed to Assad. They had uh, credible intel on the ground of rebel groups plotting to do this and do the false flag about a little over a month before it actually happened in the exact area where it happened. So they called it on Russia Today a month in advance and not a word about that on the Western media. That, that's a great point because that is true. And here's how that happened. The Syrian forces started into this suburb called East Ghouta. It's, it's like, it would be like uh, Troy is to um, Royal Oak, let's say. I mean, it's right there. It's a suburb of Damascus. The terrorists have been embedded there for the whole seven years of the war, okay? It's a real hotbed area for them. And they're firing long-range mortars into the capital. I mean, and there's no targets. They're just lobbing mortars in to cause damage, and they're killing a lot of people. And the people in Syria were not happy about the government's position. They wanted Gouda cleaned up early on, and they, they had their strategy, their reason for waiting. But when they made the move on Gouda, 
the West anticipated this would be a long, protracted battle, but the Syrians did their homework, and they swept through Ghouta very quickly, and, and the defenses crumbled very quickly. So before they could even get an orderly retreat, they basically overran them, and in overrunning them, they captured several, I'm told 15 foreign intelligence agents were swept up in that. And that's where they got the information, because those intelligence agents said we were sent to teach the rebels how to create the chemical weapon or the attack or whatever. That, that's a great point. I'm glad you brought it up. So that's why the Russians knew. And actually, the Russians challenged the West, and they said, we have irrefutable proof that this was planned and manufactured by the rebels. And the West never asked for it, of course. So, you know, we could continue to run our program. Yeah, Dennis. John, can you tell us a little bit about the Ba'ath Party and how that happens in the home season? Yeah, the Ba'ath Party was founded um, shortly after the time of the um, uh, Syrian independence movement. And it's interesting because a lot of the really progressive political movements in the Arab world have been Christians. Michelle Aflaq was the founder of the Ba'ath Party. He was a Christian Syrian. What it stands for... Uh, is Arab nationalism, socialism, and independence. That's basically their, their platform. Now, the Ba'ath Party existed in Iraq and it existed in Syria. There were two different wings of the same party. They didn't always get along, um, especially when you have strong leaders who don't, one doesn't want to surrender to the other, uh, any, any of the limelight. Uh, but there were, nevertheless, there were negotiations at different points to actually merge Iraq and Syria into one country. And I'll tell you another unintended consequence of this program by the Americans. It has brought Iraq and Syria closer together, together than ever, okay? Their military forces coordinate everything. Their air forces coordinate everything. And the Americans are sort of in the middle of this now. Okay, that was an unintended consequence. It's not going to work out well for us. But um, the Ba'ath Party uh, has been present in Syria pretty much from the point of independence. And it's been a very popular party. I mean, it, um, it's brought a lot of development to the country, especially in outlying areas that traditionally didn't have utilities, roads, schools, these types of things. So they use the, the country's wealth to kind of try to take care of these otherwise overlooked communities within the country. Uh, politically, the Ba'ath Party is a nationalist party, so it, it mirrors the national policies of, of Syria and the national values of Syria. Yeah. And, and, and it's a secular party, not a theocratic party. Oh, yeah. Party, so no. Is anyway. No, Syria is very secular, and, and the Ba'ath Party is very much secular. Yeah, always was. All right. Anything else? Oh, just one more thing. Two more things. I want to talk about the green bus. This one of the platforms that the Syrian government is using to try to bring this war to an end with the least amount of bloodshed, and it was not popular when it was kicked off, um, it started in the city of Homs. And they went to the rebels and they said, we're going to give you a choice. You can get on buses with light weapons even, no heavy artillery or mortars or anything, and we will take you and give you safe passage to Idlib in the north. That's a northern province just south of Turkey. And the Syrian people were furious. They're like, these people have been destroying the country. They're killing us. You're going to give them a bus ride to Idlib with their guns? It proved to be a brilliant strategy. And so it's called, uh, euphemistically, it's called the green bus program because they get on these green buses. Some of them don't accept. And the Army's ultimatum is if you don't accept, then you're going to die right here. So make your choice. But the bus is leaving. And a lot of them have taken it, okay? There's also been a repatriation program for Syrians, not the foreign mercenaries. The foreign mercenaries, their fate is their fate, you know? Um, but for the, the Syrian citizens, the government has offered, where it's applicable, the opportunity to be repatriated and to get back into normal society. Here's what happened with the Green Bus Program. More and more of them took the government up on it, in part because they were going to get crushed where they were, and they knew it. 
But here's what it achieved for Syria. Number one, it eliminated or minimized the amount of fighting to take place within these condensed urban areas. So it's, it saved infrastructure, it saved people's lives, it saved soldiers, it saved resources. It was a brilliant move. They got them all out of the city, they brought the people who had been driven out back, and these cities like Aleppo and Homs now are very busy rebuilding. Where are the terrorists? The terrorists are up in Idlib. Guess what's going on? Idlib's like a cage of rats, okay? They're all killing each other up in Idlib. And the government knew this. I mean, they, they weren't stupid. They knew it. They're going to go to Idlib, too. I mean, that's, that's still coming. But in the meantime, these guys, you know, they're like bands of pirates, and they're all killing each other. So by the time the government gets there, there may be very few left. But anyway, the program worked very well on many levels, although at one point, like I said, the people were very, very angry about it. They didn't think that that should, should be allowed. Um, the last thing I wanted to tell you was, uh, I talked to a guy in Syria yesterday, a friend of mine, and I said, listen, I'm going to go, I'm meeting this group of Americans tomorrow night. We're going to be talking about Syria. Is there one thing you'd like me to tell them? So this is direct from Syria. This is a young guy. He's in his 30s. His name's Amar. He fought in the, in the military, he did his time. He was injured. He has shrapnel on his back. He works with his dad. He lives in the area of Latakia, which is up on the northern coast. And he's a very average Syrian guy. And this is what he said. I wish you, and you have to excuse the grammatical problems. I wish you to tell them about the Syrian army, how it is part of the society, and how it is most of the men and women in it are civilians with university degrees. And they were just doing their services for 18 months, but this war forced them to forget about their dreams and to stay fight and fight for themselves and their families. And tell them we are not monsters, we didn't train to kill, and most of us, even in the army, fired his first live ammo when he found himself surrounded by terrorists. Uh, we don't hate the people of the Western world, but we are affected by their actions, not because they hate us, but because they just don't know the truth. So that's his message.